I believe that banking institutions are more dangerous to our liberties than standing armies. Thomas Jefferson In November 1949, Eustace Mullins was a researcher in Washington, D.C. when friends invited him to visit the famous American poet, Ezra Pound, who was confined at St. Elizabeth's Mental Hospital as a political prisoner. A leading poet and critic, Pound introduced the world to James Joyce W. B. Yeats and T.S. Eliot. During World War II, he was charged with treason for Radio Rome broadcasts that questioned America's war motives. Pound commissioned Mullins to examine the power of the U.S. banking establishment. Mullins spent every morning for two years in the Library of Congress and met with Pound every afternoon. The resulting manuscript, The Secrets of the Federal Reserve, proved too hot for any American publisher to handle. Nineteen rejected it. One said, you'll never get this published in New York. When it finally appeared in Germany in 1955, the U.S. military government confiscated all 10,000 copies and burned them. The book is available online. Why is it so, excuse the pun, inflammatory? It portrays the United States in a radically different perspective. Notwithstanding the war of independence against England, writes Mullins, we remained an economic and financial colony of Great Britain. Between 1865 and 1913, he says, London-based Rothschild bankers used agents such as J.P. Morgan and J.D. Rockefeller to gain control of American industry and organize it into cartels. Where did these bankers get the money? For over 200 years, European bankers had been able to draw on the credit of their host countries to print it. In the 17th century, the moneylenders and the aristocracy made a pact. If the king would make paper currency a liability of the state, the moneylenders would print as much as he liked. Thus the banks of England, France and the Reichsbank came into being, but they were all private corporations. Accordingly, the moneylenders got to charge interest on assets they created out of thin air. The aristocracy all took shares in the central banks, plus they got to finance a burgeoning government and to wage costly wars. This clique bought the wealth of the world using our credit. This piece of chicanery is at the heart what plagues humanity. The bankers have a vested interest in the state, that is, the people, incurring as much debt as possible. They are behind the Marxist, socialist and liberal movements which call for big government and social spending. They are behind the catastrophic wars of the last century. Naturally, if you can create money out of thin air, there is a powerful incentive to use debt to control populations and take over their real assets. This is the essence of the third world debt crisis. Dedicated to owning all wealth and enslaving humanity, an insatiable vampire has been unleashed upon the world. Much of Mullen's book is devoted to the subterfuge by which the United States was drawn into this lethal embrace. In 1913, the Owen Glass Bill gave mostly foreign-controlled banks, posing as the Federal Reserve, the right to create currency based on the credit of the United States government and to charge it interest for doing so. To accomplish this, the bankers had to rig the election of 1913 in order to get Democrat Woodrow Wilson elected. They defeated the incumbent W.H. Taft by getting their lackey Theodore Roosevelt to split the Republican vote. Then their stooges in Congress passed the new banking legislation on December 22, after their opponents had gone home for Christmas. This act establishes the most gigantic trust cartel on earth, Congressman Charles Lindbergh said at the time. When the president signs this bill, the invisible government by the monetary power will be legalized. The people may not know it immediately, but the day of reckoning is only a few years removed. Mullins explains that the legislation passed just in time for the American people to finance World War I. The European powers no longer could afford the luxury of another war. But the US was relatively debt-free and made the whole thing possible. Mullins makes a convincing case that every US president since T.R. Roosevelt has been a lackey of the bankers. In 2006, the American people paid over $400 billion in interest on the national debt, most to the central bankers. To maintain this massive fraud, the bankers enforce an iron grip on the political and cultural organs of the nation. According to Mullins, the New York Times is owned by the Kuhn Loeb, while the Washington Post is owned by Lazard Frears. In Europe, the Rothschilds own Reuters, as well as the French and German news services. The US publishers, TV networks and movie producers are similarly beholden. Rockefellers, Carnegie's and the Fords endow the nation's libraries and universities. Journalists and professors dutifully parrot fantasies about democracy and freedom. Mind control laboratories run by the CIA and the Tavistock Institute dream up ways to control the population. The psychological sterilization of the human female, or feminism, is an example. At last the cosmic battle between good and evil is out in the open. Before I continue the video, please smash that like button for me. Thank you. International bankers live in fear. Not of starvation, disease or war. 
These are the concerns of children in the third world. Bankers are terrified. We might object to paying them billions each year in interest, for money they create out of nothing, guaranteed by our taxes. The Federal Reserve Board, a private cartel of mostly private foreign banks, finagled this monopoly in 1913. The bankers are frightened that, like the homeless man's dog, we might say, I can do this myself. They are scared the government might go even further and default on trillions of make-believe debt. They are frightened of losing control. They toss and turn at night. In order to sleep more soundly, the bankers have taken steps. These precautions help us to understand the world we live in, why it is becoming safer for bankers, but less safe and more bizarre for everyone else. First, people who own money machines tend to have lots of friends. The bankers help their friends establish monopolies in oil, chemicals, pharmaceuticals, transportation, media etc., and took a healthy stake. As you can imagine, these people are thick as thieves. Lawyers, journalists and intellectuals all vie for a piece of the action. Servicing this cartel of cartels is what passes for success. The banker's first precaution is to buy all the politicians. The second is to buy the major media outlets in order to promote the illusion politicians make decisions and represent our interests. The third precaution is to take control of the education system, ensuring that people stop thinking at an early age. Then the bankers use the government and media to convince us that religion, nationalism and nuclear family are unfashionable, and we want what they want. These policies are never debated or voted on. They seem to appear out of nowhere and pretend to represent the popular will. We want secularism and the separation of church and state. Even though we were fine with Christianity and Christian values for centuries, the bankers don't want us to have any spiritual reference point that might interfere with their dictates. We want world government globalization. The bankers need to eliminate nation states, freedom and democracy in order to streamline their business and consolidate their power. The UNNAUEU, IMF and World Bank, glorified loan sharks and collectors, will make the laws. We want diversity. Countries are not allowed to maintain their national identities or traditions. Diversity is respecting every culture but European Christian. Every nation must be as heterogeneous as a box of smarties, no one in a position to challenge the bankers. We want feminism. Masquerading as equal rights for women, this ideology is designed to spread lesbian dysfunction. If women focus on finding careers, they give less importance to finding husbands. They have fewer or no children who will be raised by state daycares. Under the guise of women and gay rights, we are being re-engineered to be androgynous and behave like homosexuals, who generally don't marry or have families. Psychological and biological differences between men and women are not stereotypes. But signatories to the latest UN CEDAW convention, passed by the US Senate Foreign Relations Committee, will be required to take all appropriate measures to modify all social and cultural patterns of conduct of men and women. This kind of communist-inspired social engineering is simply persecution of heterosexuals. It is intended to arrest our natural development. Meanwhile the birth rate is halved while the divorce rate is doubled. An army of highly paid lawyers, social workers, psychiatrists and bureaucrats treat the casualties. These self-serving professionals are the banker's political constituency. People, stunted, love-starved, sex-obsessed, without family, religious or national identity, are easy to control. They'll join anything, they're looking for a family. But in case of resistance, the bankers have created a bogeyman, terrorism and fear, to justify a huge security apparatus. The Office of Homeland Security is designed to control us, the domestic population. Why would this be necessary? We're in debt trillions of dollars, and the bankers intend that we pay. One day they will take away our toys. In case that's a problem, an Orwellian police state will be in place. But first, the Muslims must be subjugated and robbed. Talking about the United States as if it were an independent country is silly. American politicians pawned U.S. sovereignty in 1913. Ever since, U.S. soldiers have been bullet boys for international bankers, and nothing else. Superpower as super gopher. The American taxpayer and soldier made the First World War possible. It started just six months after the establishment of the Fed. Its purpose was to increase debt, cripple the great European nation-states, slaughter a generation, and establish two of the bankers' pet projects. Communism, Russia, and Zionism, Palestine. After the war ended, banker world government, the League of Nations, aka, the League to Enforce Peace, was established. The US didn't enter the Second World War in December 1941 to save Western civilization. England had stood alone against Germany for more than two years. The US entered the war just six months after Hitler attacked Russia. The purpose was to save communism. For the same reason, the USSR got $5 billion in US lend-lease after the war ended. After the smoke cleared, communists instead of Nazis, tyrannized Eastern Europe. 
Soviet agents or U.S. diplomats Alger Hiss and Harry Hopkins established the United Nations on land, donated by John D. Rockefeller. One of the UN's first acts was to create the State of Israel. Ben Hecht, in A Child of the Century, wrote, The 20th century was cut off at its knees by World War I. Before committing suicide in 1942, Stefan Zweig, The World of Yesterday, spoke in the same despondent tones about the demise of Western civilization. The Earth has been hijacked. Our leaders are dupes, opportunists, traitors are all three. Almost everything we know about modern history is a hoax. A stench of moral compromise hangs over our public and cultural life. Anything promoted by the media, education or government is suspect. This is what happens when we deny moral order, that is, God. This is the world our children will inherit, one that is safe for international bankers. Comment below with more topic ideas for me to discuss. As a lot of care and hard work goes into this, likes and subscribe, let me know I'm doing a good job. All is appreciated greatly. You may not agree with everything from the content I post. Apply critical thinking and use discernment to come to your own conclusions regarding the content. Thanks for watching this video. This everything inside me channel, see you on the next video. Stay safe and healthy.